and, you know, actually, I think we will get started now. So if uh, people could uh, to put themselves on mute um, when they're not while we uh, do the introduction and then we're gonna we'll get started. Okay, so welcome everyone to our virtual table. And I hope if you need one that you have a, a beverage and, uh, and, and your food. <laughs> and so I'm gonna start with a, a land acknowledgement and I'm gonna offer, I'm in the Toronto area, but if people are from other areas, I'm gonna offer the opportunity if you know which territories you're in, if you enter it in the chat so that we can all see, that would be great. We are gathered on the ancestral lands and waters of Indigenous peoples who have left their footprints on Mother Earth before us. We respectfully acknowledge those who have walked on the Earth, those who walk on the Earth now, and future generations who have yet to walk upon the Earth. May we gain strength and wisdom that all may continue to serve as stewards of the Earth. And I also want to acknowledge that I'm in the territory of Huron-Wendat and Batoon First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. I want to acknowledge that we meet on stolen land and do this to show solidarity with Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and to recognize that decolonization must be an active and ongoing process of reconciliation. And with that, welcome again. And um, some of you know me, my name is Colleen Lynch and I've been working with Climate Fast for a few years now. And for a couple of those years, we've been planning the Kitchen Table Climate Conversations. And our motivation for this was to encourage people to gather around their tables or have a picnic or meet at a restaurant. And we envisioned these conversations as ways for people to acknowledge the climate emergency, share their feelings and ideas and move into action together. Um, you can find some resources on our, our Climate Fast website and soon to be on our new website. Um, but you know, two years later and things have changed a little and we can't meet in person, so we've been working on some online things, and I'm glad that you're able to make it here to our online table. Um, the pandemic has also underlined the urgency of putting people's health and well-being first, and it reinforces the absolute need to prioritize and take care of people and the planet. So talking about the climate crisis and climate justice and holding these conversations is as important as ever. So thank you for being here. Um, and I want to give a special thank you to the Canada Africa Partnership and the Community for Climate Action North Etobicoke for partnering with us. And I want to welcome any North Etobicoke residents and, I'm, and uh, welcome you to the conversation. So very quickly, this is going to be an interactive conversation. So I want to make a few suggestions. We are going to be posing some questions and dividing into breakout groups, just dividing into two so we can have slightly smaller discussions at certain points. We're going to be using the chat for some brainstorming and sharing and we're going to be sharing slides so if anybody has trouble accessing chat seeing the slides or joining a break breakout please do speak up and let us know and we'll do our best to make make it work for you um, and if you feel more comfortable you can always message one of the tech team privately in the chat if, if it's something you'd rather do that way uh, if you have comments or questions at any time during the conversation, feel free to put them in chat as well. Um, and if we don't get to them right away, the chat monitors, Priscilla and Eileen, you might see them here, um, are going to keep track so that we can return to anything that we might miss. And one more thing, um, the main session will be recorded. The smaller breakouts will not. And also um, the chat will be shared when we brainstorm. I want to be able to share the brainstorm. So remember, it's not completely private either. So having said that, I just want to let you know what's coming up. I'm going to show you the agenda and then turn it over to, to Anne to start us off. So this is our agenda for tonight. We're going to start with some sharing right away. And then we're going to move in and talk just briefly about some science and impacts and then move into sharing again. And we're going to talk a bit about the power of collective action and the areas we can think about that we need to change and what a better world might look like, what a better low carbon world might look like. And then some more specific actions and solutions. Some people from the group are going to be sharing some things that they're doing and um, how we can support them and what we could do next. So having at all of that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne to get us started. Thanks, Colleen. 
um, and welcome everybody. It's great to have so many people with us. Um, my name's Anne Curie. I'm a member of Climate Fast, and I'm a member of another organization called For Our Kids Toronto, uh, which is a chapter of a larger national organization called For Our Kids of parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles advocating for the future of all children. Um, so to get us started, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, we, oops, sorry, there we go. Um, we are going to be doing a sh an exercise that will be focusing on um, these three questions. So this is just an exercise so that we can get to know each other and get started and start to focus our thoughts. Um, they'll be, we'll be dividing into two groups. One will be led by myself and Val Endicott and another group will be led by Lynn Anderson and Sharon Bider. And the questions that we're going to be asking and sharing are what brought you here today? What are you hoping to learn? And what is one hope or concern that you have? There's no requirement to participate. If you want to stay in the main room, um, you're welcome to do so, but um, we hope you'll join us. So now I'll hand to our tech team to send us into different breakout groups and look forward to getting to know you more. Oh, I think people are coming back now, which is great. And um, Anne, are you in charge of the next section? <laughs> it's Lynn, I think. We'll wait for Lynn to come back. Uh, Lynn is here. Yes. So if we're going on to the science, uh, that would be uh, that would be what I'm going to do next. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, our, our purpose at this point is simply to show that there is an emergency that needs to be dealt with. So. Uh, don't get depressed, don't get too depressed because afterwards we'll give you a chance to um, share your feelings about what you learn in the science section. And we try to keep this really short because it simply goes to underline the urgency and then we will have a chance to all talk together. So we're going to give it a try. And Two degrees is the target for limiting the global temperature increase. But if greenhouse gas emissions were halted now, temperatures would still rise by up to one degree Celsius. 6,000 years ago, temperatures were at this level and America's Midwest was a desert. The world's food production centers will become barren again. In this future, mountains lose their glaciers and rivers vanish, the Indian subcontinent fighting for survival. A single degree temperature increase could eliminate fresh water from a third of the planet within 85 years. Warming at the poles happens faster than the global average 40% of Arctic sea ice has disappeared in the last 30 years. While ice reflects heat, oceans absorb it. So as ice melts, the process becomes self-reinforcing. More ocean surface means more heat absorbed, which raises temperatures, making the ice less likely to reform. Mountainous regions are at greater risk of landslides as the permafrost, which held them together for thousands of years, melts away. Low-lying countries like the Maldives are submerged as sea levels rise, and countries already hit by hurricanes face ever greater storms. At a two degree rise, people begin to die in what are now considered normal summers. In 2003, with temperatures 2.3 degrees above average, 52,000 people died across Europe. Plant growth slows down, then stops. They don't absorb carbon dioxide as efficiently, instead emitting it, the extra carbon sees global warming spiral out of control. 125,000 years ago, when temperatures were two degrees higher, sea levels were up by six meters. Today, that extra water makes up our polar ice, which is melting. By the year 2100, sea levels could rise by a meter, displacing 10% of the world's population. In this two degree future, ecosystems across the globe collapse as species migrate and fall out of sync, a third of all life on Earth faces extinction. Scientists say we can still avoid a two degree rise if we limit our carbon emissions to no more than 2.9 trillion tonnes. We've already used 1.9 trillion tonnes. We have one trillion left to use between now and forever. 
At the current rate, we'll use it in just 21 years. Priscilla, you're next, right? Thanks. Okay, good to go. So, um, I'm going to share my screen. Anybody can see us? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm Priscilla. Good evening, everyone. I'm a climate class volunteer. I'm Brazilian, and I'm going to show you some impacts of climate change in my home country. So first, I want to show you the different environments we have in Brazil. So here we have rainforest, we have savannas, wetlands here, and even a semi-arid biome. Each region is vulnerable to climate change in a different way. So let's start with the Amazon. The Amazon is a vital carbon store, absorbing greenhouse gases, slowing down the pace of global warming. Not long ago, in 2014, Brazil was a world reference in reducing deforestation. But now, deforestation of the Amazon has surged to its highest level since 2008. The Brazilian President Bolsonaro has encouraged illegal agriculture and mining activities here. The problem is not only deforestation, but also the spread of criminal fires. The fires release all the stored carbon from the forest. This is a global crisis. The scientists say that if we lose 20% of the Amazon, the forest will collapse, and we have already destroyed 17%. Now I want to show you the Pantanal. It was the largest wetland and most preserved biome in the world. Now, more than a quarter was destroyed in 2020 by criminal fires. So this harm, harm was potentially due to severe drought intensified by climate change. That's the city of Sao Paulo in the middle of the day when the winds carried all the smoke from the burning Amazon. And this map showed the number and intensity of Brazilian fires, both wild and criminal fires in 2020. Now in the region of the Atlantic forest, the rainforest in the Brazilian coast what we see there is that storms and consequently floods and landslide disasters are getting more frequent and worse every year. And now the semi-arid Caatinga. Natural disasters are more often and are related to droughts. These droughts cause agricultural losses, which can decimate food security in one of the Brazil's poorest regions that is home to 30 million people. And the region of the Brazilian savanna, the Cerrado, it has already lost over half of its vegetation to agribusiness. 
By intensifying droughts, climate change not only threatens to push endemic species into extinction, but also threatens to bring Brazilian agribusiness to financial ruin. Cities have also been affected by water scarcity and consequently power blackouts, since most Brazilian energy comes from hydroelectric power. Before, we used to believe in this abundance myth that our forests would keep more than enough water available for us forever. But now it's more than obvious that water is not unlimited, especially with the rise of the temperatures and more fires and droughts caused by climate change. Now I'm gonna pass to Anne. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, I just wanted to say I really appreciated uh, you bringing in the story of Brazil. And I think one of the things that um, will be interesting as we continue our conversation is that I know so many of us come from other places and um, it is here in, come from other places into Toronto and we bring this knowledge and experience. And so it's really important to share that. So I'm going to share some of the story of what's happening in Australia, which is my home country. Um, so Australia is a hot and dry continent and under the impacts of climate change, it is becoming hotter and drier. Heat waves, heat waves are becoming a serious problem and we are not on a good trajectory. Since 1950, the annual number of record hot days across Australia has more than doubled. Nine of Australia's 10 hottest years on record have all occurred since 2005. And in 2019, Australia had six of its single hottest days on record. The hottest temperature was reached in the Nullarbor, uh, sort of incandescent purples, but in fact, the colour that has been recently added to um, temperature maps in Australia. So it reached almost 50 degrees on the 19th of December. And the prediction, unfortunately, is that it may last a month if global warming increases from 1.5 to 3 degrees. In my own lifetime, when I was a child, we would see days, we would get up to 40 degrees and it would last for a day or two. Now I know from my family that these heat waves are lasting three, four, five days. So it's happening now. Priscilla, next slide, please. Do you have the next slide, Priscilla? It's there, I think, is it oh, not? Okay. Um, wildfires. So fueled by heat and drought, uh, fires are also becoming more intense and more extensive. And many of you may have um, read reports of the just absolutely devastating wildfires we had in Australia at the in the summer of 2019 and 2020. You can see here the image on the left um, composed of, um, it was from NASA satellite imagery, which shows the extent of the fires. Um, and on the right is a sky that, had, an image of a sky turned completely red, um, which is uh, a place up in the mountains, which in winter is actually a snow resort. So what was happening was that places that had never burned before were burning. Um, in fires, Australia lost a catastrophic one-fifth of its total forests, three billion animals died. Um, it was absolutely catastrophic. Next slide. Priscilla? Thank you. It's there, Anne. Um, another consequence of these heat waves uh, and just a um, the fact that things are becoming so much hotter and drier are increasing droughts, um, increasingly severe and increasingly prolonged droughts. In 2018, Australia battled its worst drought living memory. The Australian Climate Council projects that by 2030, winter and spring rainfall will decrease by an additional 15%. And under the most extreme scenario, parts of the country uh, would see rainfall halve by late this century. Uh, which would cripple the wheat industry, which is a major industry, but would cripple food production across Australia. Next slide, please. Another consequence of, of climate change is ocean acidification. So oceans absorb about 25% of the carbon dioxide that humans produce every year. 
and this absorbs CO2, dissolves to form carbonic acid, which is resulting in ocean acidification. And this is having a devastating effect on reefs worldwide. And in Australia, we are seeing um, incredible damage to the Great Barrier Reef, which is being bleached by um, increasingly warm and acidic waters. Um, and these bleaching events are becoming more frequent. Since 1995, the Great Barrier Reef has lost more than 50% of its corals. Next slide, Priscilla. And when it does rain, which it does, um, as is happening in other places around the world, the rainfall is coming down in um, very intense bursts, which are leading to um, flooding uh, on scales that we haven't seen before. So on the left, you see an image of the city of Brisbane, uh, which was devastated in a flood in 2018, where the Brisbane River broke its banks. And on the right, there's an image of a town in Toowoomba, which is inland in the south, um, so in the eastern part of Australia. Um, I actually have family there. And this was an incredibly sudden and intense downpour. I can't remember the exact number of um, centimetres of rain that fell, but it um, washed out just um, parts of the city. And in the farming areas surrounding, um, it also had the effect of washing away a lot of topsoil. So in Australia, as you can see, um, climate change is not something that's in the future, it is happening now. Unfortunately, our Australian government currently is not committing to climate action in the way that we would like, but um, there are many Australians who are pressing them to act. Thank you, Priscilla, for sharing those slides. Thank you. I believe I'm to lead into the next section, which is uh, also in breakouts. And our plan was to return to the same breakout site. We have additional people who have signed in. I wonder if we could have a, a group that stays in the main room, the, new, the people who were not in the original groups. Um, is that possible to, to work out? Mark, are you doing the groups? Yeah, okay, so that's great. So just to say that this is um, a section in which we're going to share sort of how we cope with um, the kind of information that we've just heard, you know, our feelings and and additional sharing that the facilitators will have. So go ahead, Mark, if you're ready. Are you ready? My turn now, and I am going to be talking about the science of social change. So some studies which may give us hope that we still can change things. Um, there was some hopeful comments in our discussion just before, um, but we are all committed to doing something. So I'm just gonna share my slides here and I'll share my screen and um, we'll see where this takes us. Okay, so um, we'll be returning to this question, but um, I wanted to start with this question. How do we get our government to take action on the climate crisis? And one answer to this question comes from a political scientist called Erica Chenoweth. And she suggests, um, she's done a bunch of studies of hundreds of campaigns over the last century, um, looking at both violent and nonviolent campaigns to change government policies or to change governments. And she found that nonviolent campaigns were twice as likely to achieve their goals as violent campaigns. And further, that once a nonviolent campaign had achieved the active and sustained participation of just 3.5% of its population, it almost always succeeded. As Chenoweth put it, no government can withstand a challenge of 3.5% of its population without either accommodating the movement or in some cases, extreme cases, disintegrating altogether. And she pointed to examples like the Philippine People Power Movement in which millions of people were marching in the streets of Manila, which led to the ouster of the Marcos regime, um, going back, looking at those who participated in the um, civil um, disobedience and non-cooperation movements led by Mahatma Gandhi in India that led to India's independence. And of course, the civil rights movement in the United States. 
course, there are many other factors, but getting people into the streets can affect change. Um, and she points out that with nonviolent, that nonviolent protests work for a number of reasons. They're welcoming of a broad range of participants in contrast to violent campaigns where you need young, fit and healthy people to fight, but a nonviolent campaign can welcome the young and old people of various uh, abilities. Um, they will attract the less active who sympathize with the cause. So if you see six people outside your window participating in an event, think, oh, I don't know, maybe I won't go. If you see 600, you think, oh, that's interesting, maybe I'll join them. But if you see 6,000, maybe you'll get out of your seat and you'll go and join that group. Um, and they also work, she points out, by to some extent disarming um, security forces. So the police or the military are less likely to fire at crowds which may include um, their own friends or family. So something to bear in mind, getting out on the street can have an effect. Another way of looking at um, social change, um, social nudges, adopting and nudging others to adopt sustainable behaviors can help bring about larger changes. And this is not to say that focusing entirely on individual lifestyle changes um, is the answer, um, but it is to say that individual lifestyle changes can add up to larger changes. They also count. It's another way of affecting change. And here um, there was an experimental study done which suggested that if you have a minority pushing for a change in a social norm, um, the adoption of a new social norm, once that minority reaches 25%, that can trigger a tipping point that pushes um, the rest of society to adopt that social norm. Everyone adopts the new practice. And other studies have shown that even when one person makes a, st a sustainability oriented decision, other people can follow. So small nudges can add up. For instance, um, of people who knew someone who had given up flying because of climate change, half of them flew less as a result. Um, personal behavioral changes can also be encouraged by government. Um, and we see this, for example, in Toronto's um, promotion of the Green Bin Project um, or making bike share available. These also work as social nudges. And a combination of personal and government approaches can be effective. So government incentives just to install solar panels can encourage homeowners to act. Um, but in effect known as social contagion, when neighbors see someone else um, putting up solar panels, they are more likely to do so too. So that has been observed in a number of um, cities. Talking about climate change, um, one of the th studies show here that one of the ways in which to introduce the topic of climate change and climate action um, is to talk up the co-benefits and make it fun. Um, for example, if you're talking about um, solar roofs, um, point out that this will also help um, generate green jobs, um, the shift to a green economy. It's a, a job producer. And of course, um, we most recently heard um, Joe Biden using this very effectively. When I hear climate, when I hear climate change, I see jobs. So he was using that strategy. Talk up the co-benefits. Um, things like this wonderful um, green wall, uh, which is in Singapore. Um, they in, not only are they beautiful and they enhance urban spaces. Um, they um, boost our mental health. They uh, improve the insulation of buildings, um, they bring nature into the city. Um, active transportation improves our personal health and our public health. So let's get everyone cycling. It not only reduces emissions, it can it overall improve our health. And for the those who are um, focused on, who have economic concerns, um, it turns out that cyclists will spend more on local shopping than people in cars who are driving by. So there are just lots of ways to talk up the co-benefits of climate um, action and climate solutions. And if you're advocating for climate action, advocating now looking at systemic changes, um, here one of the most effective things you can do is join a group. Um, I come back to this anecdote a lot and I it is that 
I once attended a film screening and the film was about climate change and the film director was asked the question that often comes up, what, are the, what can I do about the climate crisis? And his answer, which stuck to me, which really stuck with me, was you can do three things. Join a group, join a group, join a group. And that can make all the difference. Um, if you're in a group, you celebrate your successes together, you commiserate when things don't go so well, but you support each other. And your individual voice is then magnified and enhanced in so many ways. And here, uh, I put up two photos here of um, people who participated in the Canada African um, Partnership Bikeathon, raising funds for climate action in Africa. And you can see down below uh, members of Climate Fast outside Toronto City Hall. So group action can make all the difference. Um, some of you I know are already members of groups. Um, so I hope some of you might also consider joining a group. Um, and then stories of success. So stories of success provide inspiration and a path to the future, and we need these stories. Um, so here is the story of uh, Fridays for Future, which is a story of both individual and collective action. Um, the, on the um, left here, we see uh, young Autumn Peltier, who is an Anishinaabe uh, water activist. Um, she's been an amazing advocate for Indigenous um, water rights. Uh, we see young Greta Thunberg um, on her lone climate strike in August of 2018 outside the Parliament buildings in Stockholm in Sweden. So then um, Greta stages her strike, it gets some social media attention. In Canada, Sophia Mathur um, she was the first young um, person to strike from school in November of 2018 up in Sudbury. We heard about her action and a group of us um, here in Toronto organized parents and students and kids um, organized the first Fridays for Future um, climate strike in Toronto in December of 2018. We kept going with regular climate strikes once a month. The students totally took over the leadership of that. In September 2019, um, barely you know, 10 months later, what had been maybe 100 people gathered outside Queen's Park became the largest climate march Toronto had ever seen. I don't know if many of you are involved in that climate strike, but it was absolutely amazing. And that was done in a coalition of groups of union organizers, uh, Climate Justice Toronto, Indigenous climate um, activists. Um, so it was an amazing event. And Fridays for Future Toronto have continued to, to support um, Indigenous land defenders going forward. So. This is making a difference. Um, and another story of success um, is Transform TO itself. And Climate Fast, um, our group has been very actively involved in supporting the creation of Transform TO. Um, Lynn can speak about this more. Um, we organized, they organized a grassroots campaign asking for funding, delivered a petition with um, over 1500 signatures. Um, had a class visit with the councillors and Transform TO was approved by City Council. And Climate Fast has continued to lobby and support um, Transform TO along with other social justice actions. After that climate march, that massive climate march um, that we just saw, the um, Toronto City Council voted unanimously to declare a climate emergency and adopted a stronger emission reduction target um, of net zero by 2050 or sooner. So we have to absolutely keep pushing. But now after feeling so depressed about my slides about Australia, <laughs> I'm feeling um, that there is room to move here. And I just thinking about that declaration of climate emergency, I remember sitting in a meeting maybe a year before that and someone saying we need to get uh, city Council to declare a climate emergency and I was thinking oh that would never happen and it did but of course we have to hold them to account and transform that declaration into action as has been done in Vancouver so there are models to follow here 
Thank you. <laughs> I'm feeling more hopeful even as I speak. <laughs> Now I'll pass to Val, um, who's going to talk about the Greenway Conservancy. Yeah, so the Greenway Conservancy is actually a proposed um, pathway uh, that goes right through the North Etobicoke community. And um, it's, it's a vision of hope for the inner suburbs that are so poorly served uh, right now. Um, and it involves 21 kilometers of uh, a green pathway and it has a lot of, um, as they call them, co-benefits, I, I guess. It, it's in addition to building the community and um, uh, keeping people safe in terms of uh, their bike riding and so on. It also will have parquets along the way and it'll provide a lot of shade. There'll be rain gardens with native plants that um, um, absorb and clean it, the water and prevent flooding. And this is a, a picture of uh, the red um, rectangle is the need for a, a bridge uh, that goes over the, the Highway 400 to link the two communities. And it would be part of the green path, Greenway path. And it, would be built on the hydro corridor there. And just to give you a sense of what such a path might look like, uh, these two pictures on the left are from Indianapolis with the rain gardens on either side. Um, and there's a very successful greenway there now. Um, and the person on uh, the right of our screen is Darnell Harris, and he's the executive director of this um, proposal. Uh, and you can see in behind him a cargo bike. So one of his uh, dreams is that people, many, many people in this Northwest Toronto, don't they don't have cars and yet it's such a uh, car dominated area. And so uh, this pathway would allow for um, cargo bikes to be used. They, they would have a certain number of cargo bikes uh, that people could go and do uh, their shopping and whatever they need doing uh, without having to drive a car or uh, get on a very crowded bus at this point. Um, so that's um, an exciting proposal right in the North Etobicoke area that people could um, support if they uh, and feel so moved. And, and uh, a little later, I'll put uh, some information in the chat about um, how you can get involved. Thank you, Val. Um, I'll pass now to Colleen. Hi, everyone. We're going to do an interactive segment again here where we start thinking about what a low carbon world means and what it could look like and what we need to do to get there. Um, so I'm going to try to share my screen. Hopefully I do this well and get us started on on doing that. So I like to start by saying why it's important Canada, we do something as Canadians. And a lot of you have mentioned this already, but the dark red shows that we are a very high emitting country. So, and the lower color, the lighter colors show the countries that don't emit as much. So it becomes, um, uh, it becomes a climate justice issue that, can, that, that we make a difference in, in Canada. Um, and the, uh, the thing is, it's also related to wealth. So it's related to equity. And the top 10% of the wealthiest are responsible for about half of all of the emissions that are creating the climate crisis. So I'd like to show the next map after this one, if I can. Uh, there we go. And so this just shows how much of a climate justice issue it is because the green places were also the darkest red places and they are not gonna suffer as many impacts. And the places that will were the lower emitting places in the global south. And they're, they're already experiencing more impacts. And this, this map is actually showing a projection. If we don't take action, if we don't do what we, what we need to do now, so this is a prediction if we don't actually change things. So, so in a nutshell, um, equity 
is essential for climate justice and climate action. So I'd like to show this just to say why it matters, because we're a small country, but we make a big impact. So where are the areas that we can take action? I like to look at this so that we can start thinking about what it is that we can do and what we need to ask for to change. And this is a national emissions. And the red on the bottom is actually the oil and gas industry. So they emit more than any other sector in Canada. And it's the tar sands that's the biggest, um, I think it was a 400% increase in emissions from the tar sands in the past few years. And the second area is transportation. So this is where the driving comes in. And on a, um, the, the uptake in emissions here are the uh, SUVs and the light trucks and freight. And the third area is buildings. So that gives us an idea on a national perspective of the top areas. And in Ontario, this is Ontario, and it's pretty much the same. We have transportation and buildings. And then just to give you a local snapshot, some of you in uh, North Etobicoke may have seen this. This is our climate plan for the Toronto area, Transform TO, which is a really good plan and it's worth supporting. But they show in, uh, in, in, in Toronto, buildings are the top for source of emissions and then transportation and then waste. And some of the programs that climate, um, Community Climate Action North Etobicoke, they will be talking about later that you can get involved with, um, are going to address these th three areas and what we can do together about them. So thinking about that, here is our interactive exercise. This is called the quadrant exercise. And I'm going to actually do a poll and hopefully you can all participate in the poll. And, and um, then we're gonna look at this exercise again. And these are four levels on the individual level, community, industry, business, and government. And we're gonna brainstorm around it and see if we can come up with ideas for action. So, but I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute and let Ray put up the poll so that we can all take, yes, thank you, Ray. So your top choice will be what we brainstorm on. So if everyone wants to make a choice, that would be great. <laughs> They're all important, of course. That's great, about half of you have been able to vote. Yeah. Just about everyone has voted now. That's great. Just waiting a couple seconds more. There's a few more people. Okay, that's great. So I'm going to end the poll. So can everyone see the results there? <laughs> so most people in this group want to look at waste and adjust healthy circular economy. So that's what we're gonna do our brainstorm on today together. And I see actually followed up by land use and agriculture, indigenous land rights and stewardship and the oil and gas industry. So everything got one vote at least, that's great. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna screen share again and, and I'll explain this, uh, how we're gonna to try to make this interactive. I call this the lightning brainstorm. And what I'm hoping that people can do is share in chat. What I will do is I will, I will uh, read out a question there are four questions in total and I'll say go. And our chat monitor, Priscilla is gonna help us by, by counting, she'll time it out for about 45 seconds and she'll write stop. And then I'll move on to the next question. So let's see the first question. What are some actions you could take on an individual level to address the climate emergency when we're thinking about waste and a circular economy? So what are some actions you could take on an individual level? So go. So share your ideas in chat. <laughs> <coughs> it's 
thrift stores. I love that. And meditate. Oh my gosh, that's so original. <laughs> Lobby the federal government. Yes. Reduce consumption. Buy local. That's a good one. I like the educate point too. Bike for sure. Buy durable products. I like that. Vermi compost bins. That's interesting. <laughs> and the sharing economy. I learned something today about uh, an alternate recycling bin too. Okay, so Priscilla said stop. So we'll move on to the next um, question. The next question is at the community level. What do we need to see at the community level to help us take action together in the area of waste and the circular economy? So go. <laughs> Well, we could, what could we see at a community level? I actually know there's some programs going on in North Etobicoke now. <laughs> Repair cafes, great. Buyers co-ops, that's an interesting one, David. Toy swaps, they sound very useful. And shared resources, you know what? I think that it, that is really key. And maybe even in COVID, we've seen how, how to share resources and hopefully can learn from that. And the recycling process needs to be rethought. Yeah. Swap till you drop. Very cute. <laughs> so I guess we have a few more seconds here. All right. Priscilla says stop. So at an industry level and a business level, what changes do we need to ask for from our economy, industry, and business to enable a livable, low-carbon future for everyone in the area of waste and a circular economy? Go. So what do we need from industry and business to help us achieve our goals in this respect? I think some of the other answers could apply here too. Stop investing in newer, yes? Stop planned obsolescence. I'll add that one. Waste is a design flaw. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that, Catherine. Actually, voice or articulate why we will not purchase from certain places. New measures of success, not just the GDP. That is so critical. Quality. Focus on quality. I think that's true about a lot of things. Yeah. Eliminate the privatization of waste and pollution. Yeah. Okay, last question. And now this one, oops, I skipped there. So what do we need to see on a government? What do we need to advocate for together to ensure a swift, equitable and widespread change in the, in the area of waste in the circular economy? So what do we need from the government level? Go. Oh, interesting about the California strawberries. Extended producer responsibility. Yes. No more fossil fuels. I'm with you on that one. Create infrastructure for green job transfer. A just transition. And that's really key right now. Actually, in the federal um, house, the Just Transition Act is on the floor again. Remove sub subsidies for extractive industries. Yes. We think the whole concept of the economy yes i would love if that would happen and requires city government to offer contracts only to sustainable and that's it thank you so much i have one more question to help inspire us all if you would share in chat your answer to this what if we make changes that create a livable future for all what would a better low carbon world look like what are we hoping for um, and if you would just share your answers, I'll give you a minute and um, it could help motivate us to work together and keep, keep trying. Yes, nutritious food produced locally. Beautiful. Yes, planting trees, more trees, interactive communities with gardens. I love it. So 
I'm going to let you continue to do that. Walkable communities, yes. Repurposing buildings, did I just see that? That's a wonderful idea. We are going to save this chat and we're going to share the ideas in a follow-up email with everyone. So you're going to have everyone's good ideas. Hugs. <laughs> so I'm going to, while you're sharing, you can continue to share. I'm going to move on to starting the next section, which is a little bit, talking a little bit more about specific actions and solutions. We're going to um, give a few ideas of current things that are happening, and then we're going to open up the floor to discussion, and especially for the North Etobicoke residents, to share some of the programs that are going on um, that we can support and be involved in. So to start, because I'm starting, I wanted to introduce, if you, if you don't know about it already, there's this really hopeful um, group of organizations, there's over 500 of them now, who have come together to create six principles for a just recovery for all. And this is a movement to ask for changes as, as people put money into the economy after COVID, that we build back better, that we build a system that works better for everyone. So I'll put the website in the, um, the chat, but I just find this so hopeful. The very first principle is put people's health and well-being first, no exceptions. So that, of course, includes taking care of the climate. It includes taking care of people's housing. It includes so many things. Um, and another principle is building resilience to prevent future crisis. So when they put money back into the economy to help us recover from COVID, this is a movement of people who are talking about these principles and putting them forward. So I, I, I'm excited about it. So I wanted to make sure you knew about it, <laughs> but also, what can we do as a community? Um, Anne mentioned collective action. So one of the things um, that we need to do is practice citizen engage engagement. So what does that mean? It means talking to your neighbors. It means participating in the things like Anne showed the climate strike. But it could also mean tweeting on social media. It can mean using social media to amplify messages about a just recovery and a green new deal and climate action. Um, but it can also mean um, going to talk to your local government officials. And I wanted to suggest that that can be easier if you do it in a group. So if there's a few people that you connect with in your community and go talk to your elected officials about what you care about, then um, that's something you can do. And just before I give it over to Anne and Lynn, who are gonna talk about a few more specific things that are going on, what can we ask for? Well, I like this circle because it says that policies actually must triple or increase fivefold to keep global temperatures down to safer levels. So we need to ask for a lot more action. Um, and I just wanted to point out that both Canada and Toronto declared a climate emergency. So one of our one of the things we can do together is to make sure that they back up that with action and with funding. And it means like asking for things like safe bicycle infrastructure, safe cycling infrastructure. I live near North Etobicoke and I don't feel safe biking. So I'm really looking forward to some of the programs that the North Etobicoke Climate Action is offering, but we need uh, to feel safer. So we can ask for better um, cycling infrastructure and to help workers transition from high fossil fuel to lower fossil fuel jobs. And uh, anyway, these are just a few things. We will share these slides afterwards, but um, they, there are a lot of things that we could ask for together. And I'm actually going to stop sharing and let Anne and Lynn talk about some more specifics, and then we'll open up the floor for everyone. Lynn, I think you are going to go first. Yes, yes. I, I see that. I'm there. Um, so I... I wanted to let folks know about the collective action that we can do at City Hall right now. Um, Colleen was just talking about the meeting with your councillor, your elected representatives and how powerful those meetings can be. Very important at all the three levels of government. Um, and right now, actually tomorrow is the second day of budget hearings at Toronto City Hall. Uh, so Climate Fast is presenting, will be speaking. It's too late, I think, to sign up to speak at City Hall, but it's not too late to um, write a deputation with some of your requests for action. And we're based, basing our requests for action from Climate Fest 
on the commitments the city made to the climate emergency uh, in their in the declaration. Um, so I think we can put our Climate Fast uh, link in the website that has all the information. We did a training on Monday night, last Monday night, so we have all the information compiled. And um, there's really a lovely video uh, created by Mike Layton. I'll, I'll find it and put it in the chat, uh, which is part, it's his 10 minute part of the uh, presentations. Uh, that was really, it, it's just lovely to listen to. So I'll, it's very inspiring. It tells us why it's so important to, uh, <laughs> to take action. So I'll pop that link in the chat. Um, and at Climate Fast, we do also have Veterans Committee, a, um, we have an anti-racism committee, we have, um, sorry, I'm just linking a bit here, too many things going on in my mind. <laughs> At one time, we're part of the Green Neighbors Network, which is a fabulous way to organize, um, as we've seen through, through the talk that Anne gave, all the things that can be, uh, can be organized in the community and the effect that people can have on each other when, uh, when we do it together. Um, we also were thinking ahead, and this is why we're doing these kitchen table conversations now, is we're thinking ahead to the elections that are coming up. In particular, we're thinking of the provincial election in 2022, and we would like to see these kitchen table conversations happening all over the province, and especially where uh, the results might be close. There might be a chance of uh, Having, having an influence because we have people who are educated and understand what the problems are and what the solutions are. And they understand it's not just personal, that it's collective. And they understand what those could be. Because when um, City Hall, Transform TO, did a, a survey about people's concerns, definitely climate comes up as a concern for the majority of people. Uh, however, less than half, just under half, didn't have any idea what could be done about it. So we need to organize and bring that information out to people uh, so that they know how to look at people that are running for office um, and evaluate according to whether their, their um, programs are actually gonna work. Also, we have the opportunity to encourage municipalities to develop a workable climate action plan, one that has community input. So these are some of the ways we can, can influence at the um, local level, but also organizing to go and see our MPs, for example, about Bill C-12, um, the Climate Accountability Act. Um, Anne is involved in some organizing on that. Um, and she's gonna speak a bit about it now. So I'll just hand it over to you, Anne. Thanks, Lynn. Um, and I'll just um, share my slide on that. Um, so this is a campaign I'm have been working on a campaign to strengthen Bill C-12 with both Climate Fast and For Our Kids. Bill C-12, if you haven't heard of it, is the Canada Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act. It's modelled on a Climate Accountability Acts um, that have been passed in the UK and in New Zealand. The UK Act in particular has been very effective actually in significantly reducing emissions. They have met all their targets. In fact, they have exceeded all their targets, while Canada has continued to um, miss its targets by a long shot. Um, so it's great that this climate accountability bill has been introduced, but it is not nearly good enough. So we have a campaign to press our MPs to um, support amendments to this bill. And because it's a minority parliament, um, we are hopeful that we might get some movement on this. So one of the main problems with the bill is that it, the first target is 2030. Um, and the idea is that we'll get to net zero emissions by 2050. But as Elizabeth May and many others have said, the heavy lifting of emission reductions has to occur this decade and our government is not acting fast enough on that. So we're asking people to contact their MP to demand that Bill C-12 be amended to include a milestone in 2025 rather than 2030 a stronger emission reduction target um, 
of at least 50% by 2030, rather than the Harper era target of 30%, which is below what the IPC recommends. Five-year carbon budgets to keep on track, a clear legal duty to reach the targets and a more independent advisory body. If you want to learn more about this campaign, I will um, put the link in the chat. Sorry, now I'm looking for the chat. Um, but uh, it's really important to meet with your MP. And I'll just add that lobbying is often a very overlooked but very effective political strategy. People notice if you meet with your MP, your MP notices if you come. Lobbying works, fossil fuel companies do it all the time. So um, please um, make an appointment to meet with your MP to discuss this and any other climate action. Thanks. So I think we have Anne, I think we have Suleiman and Sarah who are going to um, talk a little bit. Great. Hello. Yeah. Suleiman, go for it. I think I have some photos to show for him. So whenever he's ready, I will share. Okay. Uh, good everyone. Good good evening, everyone. My name is Suleiman Hamis. I hope everyone is safe and doing well. Firstly, I would like to give a special thanks to Kitty for supporting me throughout this journey to make a change. She has always been on the front line. And I also thank Mr. Omar, Ali, and all the board members of Zanzibar Canadian Diaspora. Thank you for giving me, giving me an opportunity to speaking with everyone here today. I am from Zanzibar, Canadian diaspora, Zakaria. I started a project called Mikoko Kwanza, or Mangrove First. I start this project to be part of the change in the world, to help the worldwide issue of climate change. We are trying to restore the loss of mangrove trees in Pemba, Zanzibar. I'm also from Pemba myself and even have seen the difference of the mangrove forest from when I was young till now and could, could not just keep quiet and felt the need to do something. I have even witnessed the decline amount of many bird species and fishes that used to be everywhere, which most of them depend on mangrove forest. Even the farms where the villages grow their livelihood, the ocean has taken over. Like I said, we are trying to plant as many mangrove trees as possible in Pemba, Zanzibar. This is in Tanzania. So far, we have been able to plant 6,000 mangrove seedlings and hope to keep planting many, many more in the future. We also, to have fundraised with the help of Katie from CAP Networks, you know, everybody know her, back in November and pass our goals of over $500. It's great. The fund that was raised will go directly to the project Mikoko Kwanza, or Mangrove First. According to an EcoWatch article, 35% of the world's mangrove forests were lost between 1980 and 2000. And since the turn of the 21st century, almost one in 50 of the remaining mangrove, for, mangrove forest has been cut down. The goal is to raise the number of mangrove trees and expand mangrove forests and swamps in Pemba, Zanzibar, Tanzania, and protect, not just planting them, to protect the two. I felt, I feel that Pemba in Zanzibar, Tanzania is left out and doesn't get enough recognition like the other parts of the world, even though it is just as important. I believe this island has a lot of potential. I'm looking forward to seeing how things go and continue spreading awareness about this issue. Solution, we have to work together 
to help and support each other, whether it's government or private sectors. What I mean by that, even wealthy men or poor men, we all breathe in the same air. So we all have the same responsibility to act now, today, not tomorrow. To me, tomorrow is too late. <clears throat> People forget almost don't even know that mangrove trees and forests are so important in this world. You will hear so much about other places like the Amazon forest or like uh, North Pole ice melting, but you don't hear much about mangrove trees and the benefits of having them. They're basically neglected, neglected and talk so little about it. I hope to educate the communities and the rest of the world surrounding the mangrove forest on how to care of the plants and just about the trees in general. To invite more researchers any any university students from around the world to come to Pemba, Zanzibar to at least see what type of island it is. I really believe that there are many things to research and study and maybe even discover new species. I encourage everyone here today to help join and support us in our effort of this project. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Salama. Mm -hmm. You guys uh, ever hear about Zanzibar? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So we are here, Zanzibar Canadian diaspora. Uh -huh. So we are part of this effort, the climate change, as I said before, is affecting everyone living in this world. Either you are North Pole or in Zanzibar, Africa, we're all in this world. So we all have to act now, as I said. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Suleiman. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. And I think that once we're out of this pandemic, one day in the future, we'll be taking a group trip to Zanzibar, so long as you'll agree to be the host. You will and come. <laughs> the trees will have grown a little bit. But I think it's just, uh, it's just an example of how um, even from where you are and from at home, uh, like we all are now, you can be supporting uh, solutions. And solutions uh, on one hand, even as far away from here as in Zanzibar, um, but at the same time, uh, solutions in uh, our own neighborhoods. And so in our city in Toronto and, uh, and even in North Etobicoke. So um, we, uh, we just wanted to share a little bit more about what we, what we have uh, going on up in North Etobicoke. Uh, and I think some of those, what really what we're trying to do is make a platform. Um, so a platform for all of the initiatives and all of that to come together and share with each other, share contact information. And that, I think that's exactly what KTCC does. So just the chance to meet new people tonight and share uh, these links and information is uh, really what we're here for. Um, and I think I could even see an opportunity for um, a group that's interested to, to get together for a session with Climate Fast and write to our MPs or uh, learn how we can do deputations or learn how we could um, do lobbying, like you said, Anne, that can be really effective and targeted. Um, but can I, can I just share to one of my colleagues, maybe Sarah Tamar, um, uh, Makan is here. Uh, there's lots of lots of folks from the North Etobicoke group here. So if one of you wants to just share a little bit more about um, what we've got coming up, that would be great. And I see that there's a note in the chat. Uh, Lily is asking, how is climate change affecting the mangroves? I had read that increasing acidification of the ocean is killing the mangroves. Mm -hmm. Is that a question for Suleiman? How is climate change affecting the mangroves, Suleiman? As uh, 
it's like uh, the sea rides, as I mentioned here, the the farms that ocean is taking over now. So that's the sign of uh, sea rising. But uh, as you know, because uh, in Ontario, you don't have mangroves. So mangroves live in the oceans only. And I say it's a ideal a, a habitat for some kind of fishes and birds and other creatures. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very serious because uh, the number is declining very quickly, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, not much been talking about in that part of the world, Zanzibar in Pemba, but the situation is very serious. I was I, 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 I was born there, so I know. No, exactly. Thank you very much, Suleiman. And I think um, uh, you were saying, Katie, there may be someone else who would like to speak about your next event. Uh, and as, uh, as you get ready to do that, I'd just like to say that at this point, this is where we want to hear what you're inspired to do. Like, what uh, did something inspire your interest tonight? What would you like to have as the next steps? You know, we, we looked at one area of action and that was waste. Um, we have other areas of action to, to look at, um, and we do have the upcoming training for facilitators as well. But we would really like to know what inspires you, what you would like to do, um, what you, any feedback for us that you might have, and, and so on. But first of all, I'll just go over to Katie again and see, is there someone who would like to share a bit about your next event or events? Sure, yeah, I just wanted to see if Sarah or Tamar were there and wanted to take it. Okay, well, we'll leave it open for them. Um, and at the yeah. same time, if others would like to, to jump in, um, this is your moment and you can put it in the chat or um, if you could just indicate with an S in the chat or a hand raised in the participant list that you would like to share, um, then we could hear what you're thinking of for next steps or how you're feeling at the end of this particular conversation that we've had tonight. Any feedback is, is very welcome. All right, great. So I, I just want to outline some of the, the training sessions that we are going to be having, um, you know, coming up because we really want to continue it. And so we are going to be having, let us focus on the climate fast as an example. Um, there are a number of trainings that are planned. We, we have on March 1, we have, you know, bringing people together. On March 15, we have model conversations. On March 29, we have a technical nuts and bolts. And on April 12, we have collective courage Separating apart from that, you know, we are going to be having presentations to be done by Cycle Toronto. We are going to be having presentations to be done by Better Homes, and we are going to be having presentations as well by the Rexdale Centre. So those dates will be communicated with you in short order, but in a nutshell, those are some of the training and upcoming workshop that we, we have in the pipeline. Thank you very much, Timar. That's great to know. Um, and I'm putting in the chat an event that's happening tomorrow night. That's a climate forum. Um, and it's on overcoming the climate crisis. It's with, uh, it's, it's, we're co-sponsoring it with um, Science for Peace. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> sorry. Yes, we're getting a few little links there on action. So overcoming the climate crisis, I put it up a second time there. Um, because that is tomorrow night. And it has a U of T uh, climate scientist, Danny Harvey, also Ali Rougeau from Fridays for Future and another youth speaker. Um, and it's an opportunity as well, like we're doing right now to bring forward ideas of projects and uh, ways we can work together. Um, so um, I think Ray's putting in all four links to our training series that will start on March 1st and run every two weeks. And that is for people who would like to be facilitators of, of this kind of conversation. Um, 
So we'd like to open it now if people have ideas they'd like to share. I'm looking for hands raised on the participant list or you could put a note in the chat. Uh, and we are interested in, 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 in feedback. If people have feedback. That would be... Uh, Kate, Katie, um, there's an S in the chat from Lily, but I also wondered about Sarah, uh, if she wanted to say anything. Uh, thank you so much. Um, other than that, we're also inviting uh, people to also join Africa Climate Action Initiative, uh, not just in North Etobicoke Initiative, but also um, in other initiatives. Like, for example, we are training um, people on um, alternative transport, like riding bicycles and, um, and uh, various others, including supporting education facilities. You can visit us in our website so that you can see uh, the various initiatives that we are undertaking and probably join and also share with your, with your groups. Thank you. Great. Um, there's a note in the chat, which is great. Go ahead. Hi, I just want to um, share a an initiative that uh, started early last year called the Equal Just Local. Um, sorry, Equal Just Food Network, and it's um, basically uh, what we're trying to do is is uh, start an alternative um, food system that is local and resilient uh, and just um, that also um, centers regenerative agricultural practices. Um, our goal is to connect marginalized urban communities uh, with local and regional farm and food providers who are engaged in regenerative um, uh, practices, um, both to increase the food security for uh, vulnerable urban communities and also to increase the economic security of small scale farmers, uh, especially those that um, want to farm in an earth um, regenerative way. Uh, so I'll, I'll put the website in the chat um, and I would very much like to connect with um, community organizations in Etobicoke North um, because I think that uh, uh, a lot of communities in, in Etobicoke North could very much benefit from, uh, from the Food Network. Um, right now we are largely based in St. James Town, um, but we're, yeah, we're hoping to expand. That's Thank it. you, Lily. Do we have any more hands, people who'd like to speak? Um, we're Even if anyone to... has a question. Or a question. Good idea. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, having uh, an entire session on uh, the leaky leaky houses uh, and what what can I do to um, you know improve my insulation um, without you know doing a massive renovation. Thank you. We, we do have a uh, retrofit working group that's so working on those things. Absolutely. So maybe just put your note in the in the chat if you'd like someone to get in touch with you about that specifically. Um, that will be great. Um, any others who would like to speak? I think we, we have a survey link which we'd be very happy to have you fill out. I think that's going to be put in the chat. Um, so please do give us your comments and <laughs> uh, feedback on the evening. And you can also speak now and give us some feedback if you like to what, what was effective about tonight, what do you have questions about, um, what would you change, um, or what potential can you see for it? You know, where, where should we go with this uh, kitchen table conversations? I'm looking for hands up. I don't see any hands up right at the moment. Um, 
Lynn, Colleen has her hand up. Okay, Colleen, please go ahead. I just wanted to, before everybody has to go, thank everyone. This has been a really good evening and I really like to hear about all the initiatives that I just heard about. Um, and I'm going to say people are asking in the chat if we are going to be able to share these links and the chat information and we will with a follow up email. Um, also, Katie, you have a very good calendar that you're putting together on your website. So I think Katie um, can share her website again before we close and you can always check the calendar there too because she's doing a very good job. Um, so yes, and, and just thank you all. And yes, we, we still have um, quite a few minutes, like at least 10 minutes left. So if there are anything, anything else or any other questions, we're still, we're here. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to respond to the leaky house comment in particular, because <laughs> that's a big one. Um, but we'll be setting up one of the sessions is going to be um, particularly focused on that and it'll be run with Better Homes TO. So they should be able to answer some of your questions about leaky houses. And uh, the date's not set for it quite yet, but we'll be letting you know when that is. And, um, and yeah, we'll try and compile all of these. So when we get the email, cause there's even some new links for us, we'll add it all uh, up there. So hopefully that can be a place where some of this is compiled. Um, and thank you, Climate Fast, for organizing from us. And just the final comment is, um, you're, you may be eligible to have a tree planted on your property for having participated in this session. So I'm going to sit, put a link about that as well. Uh, and hopefully you'll have a leak-free house and a beautiful tree in your yard. So here it comes. Thank you, Katie. And there's a, a note here about the Drawdown Toronto Food Waste Challenge. So please uh, take note if you'd like to participate in that. It's going on now. I think it's uh, coming to the close of the first week and there are five more weeks remaining yeah. in the challenge. Um, so are there, you know, this is a chance for closing comments. So actually we love to go around in here just even, you know, 10 or 10 seconds or 30 seconds just a feedback or even one word. So maybe how are you feeling at the end of the evening tonight? It could be a word or a phrase or a sentence. Um, who would like to start? And we'll just go around. I could say I'm just maybe a bit overwhelmed with the number of initiatives that are going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can we join together and form a solid coalition? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, David. Um, you, uh, any, <laughs> maybe when you finish, David, if you can see someone else on the screen, just oh, pass it over to them. Pass okay. it to them. All right, well, I, I see Katie. Uh, very encouraged. Thank you. And I agree with you. I agree with you, David. Um, but thanks, everyone. Great to meet you. And thanks for sharing. How about Priscilla next? Hi. Thanks. So it was, it was a great evening. Uh, I really enjoyed this time with you and sharing all the, the experiences, not only in Canada, but around, uh, around the world, in Brazil, Australia, and Africa. And, and I think it's really, it's very hopeful to, to see so many people taking action. Um, so I'll pass it to Maya. And we've been in India too, there is so much climate problem globally challenge, so many waters and like rivers and all are polluted, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciate um, how, again, I've said this in the chat, but I really appreciate how well organized this is. Uh, I feel like I have a lot of potential resources, which is really wonderful. Um, and there wasn't a lot of unnecessary repetition of things that um, are not immediately useful or, or that I know. So I really appreciate that. Um, I just, it, it's a huge thing. So I, I, it really feels good to feel like this really is a launching pad and it's it's really well prepared for that and that feels really great <laughs> and and you know 
from from where I'm coming from uh, in the the downtown group, uh, the East End uh, group, the, uh, it's it's uh, for me all about you know how can how can we help you and how can you help us and hopefully hopefully good will come of, of this. Thank you, Mar. <laughs> um, I feel encouraged. It was great to meet so many new people and feel that there are connections on a number of different levels. Um, it was great to learn more about the um, Africa Climate Initiative and everything that's going on in North Etobicoke. So I hope we continue to grow this relationship. I'm, I'm feeling encouraged. Um, I will pass to um, Val, I'll pass to you. <laughs> yeah, I learned a lot and I enjoyed uh, talking and listening to people and I do feel, well, I, I can't say I feel hopeful exactly, but I, I feel um, in, in very, positive company, you know, good company. Um, and I think that um, to the point uh, around, you know, needing to all um, coalesce and be part of one big movement, I, I'm really looking to how we can, we can do that. Um, so it's great to be here at sort of in this small number uh, and how we can spread our, our concerns and and I was very moved by Anne's um, sort of explanation of how, you know, um, it can start small and, and get very big very quickly. <laughs> so that's a nice thought. I will pass it to Lily. I'm, um, I'm glad that I attended. Um, it's, yeah, it's great to see what everyone is doing, uh, especially all over the world. Um, I admit the the presentations on the effects of climate change was a were a bummer, but <laughs> I guess we need to know. Um, but uh, but it's it's also good to know that despite all of the uh, climate grief and anxiety and hopelessness uh, that seems um, to be pervasive, that that people still, despite um, all of those heavy negative feelings, that that we're still determined um, to do something about it, and that we haven't we haven't given up hope. Um, and so forth. So I think that is is a very very good thing. Um, yeah, and I look forward to making and continuing connections out of this. So thanks, everybody. Uh, sorry, I will pass this on to um, to Dee Stapleton. Just before Dee speaks, I want to mention that I acknowledge it's nine o'clock. And if somebody does have to leave, because that was the ending, you are, you're welcome to leave. But I really would like to keep it open for people who, who want to, to give their checkout. So don't feel obliged to stay, but feel welcome. My battery is running out on mine. <laughs> so, but I have found it encouraging. Uh, that there are people and I had one thing I'm not fast on the chat on the printing I have a very small mini pad and my fingers hit the wrong notes so it's not very good but um, I'm encouraged in that and you're talking about housing and is anybody putting in that all houses should be built so they're accessible we need to, the new, any new houses that go up, if they're built to start so that they're accessible, then you don't have to move if something happens to you. So that's my thought. But I have enjoyed the, the discussions and I am encouraged and I think I've picked up some things here and there. <laughs> Thank you.
Anyone else would like to jump in and make a comment before we close? We will close in a minute or, or so. But uh, your thoughts are welcome. If anyone hasn't spoken yet, who would like to share? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for you guys coming to listen and even for Climate First to organize this forum. We really appreciate it. And uh, also on behalf of uh, Africa Climate Action Initiative, we invite you also to view some of the initiatives that we are taking, the training dates and, and the calendars for various events so that you can invite others to also join in and uh, be partakers of uh, the activities that we'll be undertaking. Thank you so much. And it was a wonderful meeting. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I, I see that Jay has a comment in the chat, feeling encouraged by new participants and new initiatives. Uh, and Zanzibar, uh, uh, yes. So I would like to make sure to thank uh, everyone who participated in creating the evening tonight. Um, the Climate Fast website has just gone up. It's it's a team effort. Can I request one thing? Because it's just too much to take all this information through chat. So is there any way I can get it in all in email? And I'm so happy to see that there are so many people who are worried about global climate change here because I thought people, because in Etobicoke, like I, I, my community, I know that we try to utilize everything, but many, so much wastage is there, food and clothes and all. Like, I don't know what happened to all those things. Where do they go? Do they go to which, uh, like, organic uh, manure or not? But it was nice to see that there are so many young generation who's in, involved in this. At least there is a hope and faith that the world will be a better place one day. Thank you, Bina. Great. Great. Okay. I always used to think that fridge, when the invention of fridge came, the thing started deteriorating day by day, day by day. Storage, 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 storage. And so much Sorry. this thing. Yes. Thank you. I would like to mention that this has all been put together by a team. Uh, our tech team I'd like to thank, and that's Mark, Ray, Sharon, Anna. Uh, Brian's also been helping out, and I believe Eileen as well tonight. Um, and the program is designed by a team. We meet every Friday at 5, that um, kitchen table climate conversation team. So people are welcome to join um, our group. And Colleen is, has taken the leadership in designing and uh, facilitating our meetings, making sure we carry on with this. He's done a great deal of work on materials. We've also had Sharon's input, Val, and Priscilla is involved. Um, myself, I'm not sure. I don't want to miss anybody. So jump in if I'm forgetting someone. And our outreach team, which has included Colleen as coordinator of outreach uh, for now. Also Faria, Brian, Eileen, I believe Anna may have been helping with that as well. Um, we are all volunteer, and so it's a team. Um, please jump in if there are additional thank yous to give for tonight. I want to thank Leo for timekeeping tonight. We did a fairly good job at that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, we've done pretty well. We're close to nine for our completion. And again, uh, we would love it if you would fill in the survey. Maybe we could have that link again. Um, and I did send that link out in your final reminder notice for tonight, the link to the survey. So if it's easier for you to find it that way, it's there. And uh, there are some other links in there. And we will send a follow-up email um, with the recording. And there's the survey link in the chat again. And um, sometimes we, at the end, we just take a picture of uh, the screen by um, seeing if we can have everybody as, as far as possible, we can see, and we unmute. I think we unmute everybody, and we can say goodbye and thank you. Are we ready for that? Ready. Is everybody ready? So let's uh, unmute and uh, off we go. Bye, Hi. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.